going to be talking to you today about utilizing gills to develop and support a culture of research in your company. So a little bit about me, uh, I'm a senior digital product designer here at Stoyful and my work involves um, leading the user research, research initiatives and I'm also a member of the steering committee of our design system. And so I joined the company in October 2017, so I'm here nearly three years. And I'm just going to go into the background of Storyful just so this talk has a bit more context. So we're a social media intelligence and news agency, and we use unparalleled access to data, proprietary technology, and sophisticated analysis to deliver actual insights to our partners. And what that means is our journalists and analysts look to license and sell social media videos, and they also perform social media analysis on behalf of news organizations and our commercial partners. So on the product team, we develop web-based applications to support these tasks. And within Storyful, we use Agile as our delivery method. In particular, we use Scrum. So we're set up in multidisciplinary teams. Uh, these teams comprise of one designer, one, uh, one product owner, one QA engineer, and three to five developers. And we work in two week release cycles called sprints. And at the end of these sprints, we have demos where we show stakeholders the work that we've been doing. And at the start, we were using demos as a way to gather user feedback. We were small, we were about one, one or two scrum teams at the time. And essentially we would show the stakeholders the work that we've done. We'd ask them, do you like it? Do you see value to it? Will you use it? What do you want us to work on next? And because we were small, the risk for this was relatively low. Um, if we went down the wrong path, we could just stop, change, and go back. So it worked for us. It was fine. But in 2013, we were acquired by News Corp, and we we scaled rapidly. We went from we went up to six product teams. Each team had many more products, loads more stakeholders. There was a lot going on. So we decided to add the Spotify model on top of our existing uh, Scrum model, just to help help Agile scale a little bit easier across the, across the company and to prevent people from feeling more isolated. So we added chapters as a way for people of the same discipline to share knowledge and kind of come together and just chat about the work they're doing. And then we also added guilds so that people across multiple disciplines could come together and talk about um, specific topics and just share knowledge really. But as we were scaling, we were starting to see a lot more issues. So we were hearing, we were seeing a lot that what people were asking for versus what they need, needed wasn't really lining up. So we heard a lot of complaints such as, well, we built that feature, but nobody's using it. Or we added the button they asked for, but now they're saying it's not what they really needed. So we were building a lot of unnecessary features and we were wasting a lot of time doing the wrong thing. And so Agile methods are focused on developers and they grew out of programmers' attempts to solve common pain points experienced during these big software development projects. So. You know, Agile was really good at helping us move quickly and ship features really quickly, but it wasn't really helping us understand what we should be shipping and where we should be going with the products. And so when I first joined Storyful, I was, um, I was finishing up my master's in user experience design in IDT, and we were doing a lot of user research. Uh, and I kept thinking that maybe this is something that we could really use in the company and this might mitigate a lot of the issues that we were having. But as I was new to the company and it was a completely different way of working that we'd never experienced before, we had kind of had to test the waters first and see would it be a right fit. So initially I joined a team that were working on the beta release of a new product. And from the start, it was pretty clear that we needed to do, we needed to do some more kind of customer and user research. And I had a chat with the product owner at the time and kind of discussed with them the financial, well, the financial issues really of releasing a product that isn't fit for market, so releasing a product that people can't or won't use, essentially wasting our time. And um, so he, he agreed and he let me go off for a few days and do some research. So we ran some usability studies with uh, SMEs within the company, just to understand some of the pain points around actually using the products. And then we did some secondary, uh, some secondary customer research, just, just to understand what did our customers really need out of this product. And so from it, we're able to, to develop personas and understand a lot of the issues that were still existed within the products. And thankfully we managed to fix these before the beta release. 
And so a couple of months went by and my team was later refocused to work on a new search tool in the company to replace some of its predecessors. So as a team, we had a chat with the product owner and we let him know that we were, to be honest, we were quite worried about repeating the past mistakes of the previous tools. Again, he, thankfully he agreed and he allowed, he allowed us to go off and do some field research. So myself and one of the developers went off and shadowed uh, stakeholders from across the company to understand what were the goals they were trying to do? What were some of the issues they've encountered with not just our own tools, but external tools they were using as workarounds? And what opportunities were there for us in developing this new product? And so we created an affinity diagram at the end and we uncovered a number of issues, a number of different directions and opportunities. We had a, we had a meeting down with the product owner and we were able to help him develop that initial roadmap to get the product off the ground. And so, with the success of these uh, early studies within my, uh, my Pacific Scrum team, I was looking for opportunities to actually scale research across the product team on a wider basis. And within Storyful, we have um, a product offsite every six months or so. And at this offsite, we, uh, we meet with key stakeholders from each pillar group to understand their business needs so that we can align our product development to help them meet that. And at this particular offsite, we found that there was a considerable issue with uh, stakeholder capacity and across, across the whole company, but we had absolutely no idea why this was happening. So the head of products asked the design team to actually look into this and do some research and see what we can do about it. So we recruited 12 people from across the product team, so developers and QA engineers to help us with this. And we decided to do some field research. So before we were doing this, just to make sure everyone was comfortable and everyone was kind of up to speed in terms of the fundamentals of what's expected, we ran a half day workshop. And in this workshop, we went over the format of a field study, the different type of things you should be looking for, just general considerations in running this kind of study. And then we'd have some time at the end to discuss any questions or concerns. We then created a note taking, a note -taking template based on the uh, AEIOU framework. Again, just to help people understand what they should be looking for while they're doing this. Once we had this out of the way, we created um, created a timeline for who we were going to be research, researching with and when. We paired one designer with, uh, with another person from the product team and they went off and, sh and shadowed multiple users. And so at the end of this two week period, um, we set up a war room. We put together a skeleton of a service blueprint uh, design, or sorry, a service blueprint map. And we chose this technique because we want to see the issues from start to finish of the entire pipeline. So from sales, all the way to customer delivery. And when we ran the session, we brought back in all the people who helped us gather this research and as well the product owners. And we specifically want the product owners there so they could see the value and the impact of what we were trying to do. So as a group, we worked through all the findings, we uncovered a number of issues and we agreed next steps. And at the end of this, we put together a report uh, summarizing all this that we shared with the exec team. And so at this point, there was a lot of excitement about research and we were looking for ways to, to really help support and develop this culture more. And I, rem I remember that we had the opportunity to create guilds now within the company, uh, which were a great way for uh, people across disciplines to come together and discuss this kind of thing. So I had a chat with my manager and we both agreed this would be a good idea. And its sole purpose should be to develop and support this culture of research we've been working on. So we started the sessions last summer and we left the agenda quite open. We wanted people to just bring the to like topics and ideas they were interested in and the group kind of just have a chat about it. But we had a lot more people coming than we expected who actually want to learn some fundamentals and some techniques that they could bring into their work. And due to this open format, they weren't really getting much value from it. So we noticed the numbers started to drop pretty quickly. So we stopped, we changed tack, we made a list of things that we thought would be really good for people to learn and things that they could apply straight away. So now we run the meetings as workshops. The first half an hour is an introduction into the different, into the technique we're covering that day. And the second half, uh, people are paired up in groups and they can go off and practice them and they can ask us for advice on better ways to perform it. So at this point, people were starting to bring research into their teams and it was really starting to scale up quite quickly. And at this point in time, we, reali we realized we needed some principles around this to help guide and structure the approach. And we didn't want to just bring in any generic principles. We wanted something that would match with the agile way that we've been working. 
So we work in we work in MVP. And I was reading just enough research by Erica Hall, and that book covers the idea of minimum viable research, so MVR MVP. And the whole idea around this is that you do just enough research to answer a well-defined research question. So the exact same way we develop our features. And so we realized this is perfect as we allow research to be done in tandem with product development. So one wouldn't slow the other down. And once we'd done this, we started looking at our methodologies. So as we had a number of people who were quite new to research, really excited to do it, but really intimidated by how vast the landscape is. We decided to hone in on what we thought would be the most effective um, methodologies that people could use. And we got this down to five based on, five, um, based on six key use cases that we have. So now we recommend using focus groups. And we recommend this to uncover stakeholder analysis methodologies. We use interviews now to develop potent, or to define potential feature development opportunities. And also, we are also, or, and also we interview our sales team to understand our customers' goals and pain points. We run usability studies to uncover issues before and during development. We run field studies to understand higher level issues across stakeholder workflows. And also we run remote surveys, and this is done to measure the impact and usability of recently released features. And so again, to reduce the complexity needed to figure out when to do research, what methodology should be used, we looked at the product life cycle that we have. And since the early days of sprints, we still use these, but we've added another layer of organization on top, which are called product release cycles. And these cycles are comprised of three sprints. And the goal of the product life cycle is that the team is working towards this one release, this one feature, this one overarching goal, and using the three sprints to make it there. And so at, in sprint one, we're rec now recommending that people do field studies or focus groups or interviews to understand the problem landscape and the opportunities within it. And then once those are defined and the team starts working on a possible solution to start running usability studies, just to understand, is this the right direction? Is there a major, major thing I'm forgetting here? Am I doing the right thing? Should I stop and start again? And then the same thing in sprint two, as we've kind of nailed down the direction we're gonna go and the way we're gonna solve this problem, start working through a lot of the bigger issues with it. And then for sprint three, it's just all about refining and making sure it's ready for release. And we're quite confident that it's going to solve the problem that we defined earlier. Also, we recommend doing your remote survey at this point in time. And that's for the feature you've released in the previous cycle. So it's been out in the world now for six weeks. You're going to get a sense of realistic usage from it. So you'll be able to measure these things quite effectively. And you can do this on an ongoing basis then. And now that we'd standardized our um, principles, our methodologies, our timelines, we started looking at the studies themselves and is there a way that we could standardize the approach? And our goal in doing this was to reduce the time spent rewriting usability studies and surveys and everything else over and over again, even though they follow the same format pretty much every time. And to, to reduce the kind of cognitive load of this as well, because it, it takes quite a lot out of you to create these studies sometimes. So essentially we put together full usability studies, forms, everything that we covered in our list of methodologies, but we left placeholders so that people can add content that's actually just relevant for their uh, study. So that's the only little bit of it that they actually need to worry about. And the hope of this is that it would make doing research also more efficient. We created a shared Google Drive then to house all this and we shared this across the whole team. And over the coming months, we actually found that people were starting to share their research within this folder. And not just the designers or people working on the, pro on the product direction side of stuff, but developers and QA engineers as well. So seeing this, we created a dedicated area for people to share this stuff. And we created discipline-based uh, folders as well. So people from front end, back end, QA, DevOps, they can all share their material with each other because we're a small company. We share a lot of the same stakeholders and a lot of this research is relevant to different people at different times. So it's good to always have that bank there. And so with all this, there's three key learnings we've kind of picked up along the way. So if you try to do too big an initiative too quickly, you might find you get a lot of pushback and there's multiple reasons for this. Sometimes it could be financial. Sometimes it could just be 
quite a big risk. Um, but often, from my experience, I found that if people are very used to working a very defined certain way, if you try to change that overnight, you're going to make people extremely uncomfortable and they're going to naturally fight back. So start small. The smaller you go, the less the risk, the less money involved, and the easier it is to get that opportunity and that space to try something out. And the more of these small initiatives that you do, um, the more people you'll, get, you'll gather on your side because they'll start to see the value of what you're doing. So it's a bit like a snowball. The more of it you do, the more people you get on your side, the more momentum you get, and the easier it is for that culture to start developing almost on its own. And then when you've got to that point where you have people interested and you have a culture and you, you have people involved, and you're looking for like best practices to kind of frame this and structure it a little bit better. There's a lot of these best practices around, floating around, but everyone's company is different, different shape, different sizes, different budgets, etc. For us, we're a small product team. We uh, don't have a budget for dedicated researchers. So using MVR was the most appropriate approach for us. Just ensure whatever you do matches your, matches your culture and matches your scale. Because if it's seamless, it'll help the culture to stay on its own. And so these are some of the resources that I use along the way. Um, if you're trying to do something similar, hopefully these can help. Um, I've also attached my social media, um, my social media stuff on this. So if you want to reach out to me, feel free. I'm more than happy to talk about this. Any questions?